probably in my late 20s and taken into this place called the Cathedral of Pain where Lucifer came to me and put a talon right through the, the middle of my third eye and left a scar which is still visible to this day and told me I belonged to him forever. And then I was cast out of that cathedral, which was a horrible place, back down to earth in a pillar of fire, landed in the backyard of my home. Fortunately, it was summertime, no clothing on. I landed in the backyard with a blaze of fire, and there was a ring of burning fire in the lawn around me. And so people say, were well, you doing drugs? <laughs> well, yes, but not at that particular evening. And it's hard to explain, you know, drugs when you've got, you know, like this, like meteor crater in your backyard. I, I'm glad I, I left early that morning before my folks got up and said, what happened in the backyard, you know? And then there was the fact that I would, both Sharon and I, when we were driving out to Utah to be married in the temple for time and all eternity, we were continually buzzed by UFOs, especially once we got into the Utah desert. Because let me tell you, you get out in those deserts, like Utah and, and um, Nevada, uh, Four Corners region, Arizona, New Mexico, there's some very strange stuff out there, really strange. The Panamint Mountains, some of those regions. Uh, I mean, even the Native American people for centuries have reported, you know, that there are strange things going on within those mountains. That brings us to underground bases. How's that for a smooth segue? Uh, a key component of understanding how all this fits into the end time plan is the idea that there has been a collusion between our government and the Bnei Elohim, the sons of God. Uh, treaties were entered by the Eisenhower administration back in the 1950s where deals were made that basically uh, we would get a lot of advanced technology from these aliens, stuff like, you know, Velcro and Teflon and, you know, microchips or whatever. And it is interesting to note how technology just expanded geometrically after the 1950s. I heard one scientist give a lecture where he said that we have had more scientific discoveries since the late 1950s than since between the 1950s and the time of Yeshua. Just think of that, because I mean, that's almost all of our lifetimes. Think of all the stuff we've seen. You know, I remember my grandmother saying, she was born in 1888, and she says, I can remember as a girl, you know, being ridden to school in a buckboard, and I lived to see men walking on the moon. You know, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary when you think of it. And she was, you know, she lived to be 96 or 97, but I mean, she was, she was like in her 80s at that point. So anyhow, we get supposedly all this technology and in return, the aliens, whatever they are, the B'nai Elohim, get to experiment on a few of our citizens. You know, pull them up in the spacecraft. Oh, they also get to kill a few hundred cattle here and there and cut out their innards. But that's another talk. <laughs> anyway, um, so... The other thing they get is they got the right to build these underground bases. And then they would share them with us. And you know how the government is about acronyms. You know, CIA, FBI, NSA, da 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 Well, they had to call these DUMBs, Deep Underground Military Bases, D-U-M-B. <laughs> I hope they fired whoever came up with that one. Anyhow, this is supposed to be a joint effort between the military and our aliens. And what happened is, is the aliens gave us the technology to build this, it's called a subterrane. And basically it moves through the earth at five miles an hour. And it's got some kind of thing that's like a laser, but a hundred times powerful in the front of it that burns this circular thing that's about just a little bit bigger than, say, you could drive a train through this big cylinder, and it moves, and with this you can, well, you know, five miles an hour, you could, you know, make some good progress, and it melts the rock so that when it comes out the other end, it's as smooth as can be, just like volcanic glass. Don't believe me? There's a the picture of one. That's a U.S. Air Force subterrane. And um, basically, these tunnels honeycomb 
the Southwest especially, but they're even in this part of the country, they often are connected to old U.S. military missile silos or even not so old military silos. Uh, but I know they're especially strong in the, in the Southwest, the Four Corners region. And there, there are bases that are up to five miles deep beneath us, entire cities down there. And um, in fact, I, I know there's this one fellow who has since been murdered, <laughs> but he, he was actually a, a worker. He was a military worker in the, one of these bases. And the aliens were supposed to keep to the lowest levels. And the humans were supposed to keep to the upper levels. But apparently some alien made a mistake, and this guy said, he was on an elevator riding from whatever level to whatever level, and all, you know, the elevator, ding, you know, the door is open, and in walks this, you know, seven foot tall lizard in a lab coat and, and a black tie, you know, complete with pocket protector. <laughs> and he just, you know, what do you do? You know, kind of how you, you know, what do you do when you're in an elevator with a seven foot tall lizard? You hope he's not hungry, you know. And uh, the guy just totally freaked. As, and, and they said later on the lizard was demoted for doing that. But anyhow, uh, let's see, he was a reptilian. And what happened is, is it ended up that the, the military discovered that the aliens were not keeping their part of the treaty. Big surprise. You know, the devil's a liar and a deceiver. Whoops. And so what happened? an underground war broke out and we try to take back some of the levels of this uh, of this under these underground bases and it was a horrible slaughter thousands of people were killed and probably a fair number of aliens as well but they had superior technology some people claim that the underground nuclear testing that we were doing some of you may remember that in Nevada I think that was in the 60s uh, that that was actually a cover-up for us detonating underground nuclear warheads to try and kill some of these aliens. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's, that, that's what is alleged. And as a result of that, especially in the Four Corners region, in Dulce, that area, that has now been totally given over to the aliens. And if you go down there, man, you're lunch. So nobody goes down there anymore. And also, these same aliens have been seen elsewhere. Uh, of all places, they're seen in a mall in Salt Lake City. After closing hours, this mall, it was one block from the Salt Lake Temple. In the heart of downtown Salt Lake City, this cleaning lady comes around the corner with her bucket and mop, and she sees this giant lizard standing there in a lab coat with a clipboard. You know, what do you do? She shrieked and ran one way. He went Pah! and ran the other way because he wasn't supposed to be seen. And, you know, there's, there's so many reports, this, including I've, I've had a couple of encounters with these things, which I'd rather not discuss because they're very disgusting. But uh, these things are real, believe me. And they also have a very bad... You know, have you ever been in, a, in a, like a, a, the snake house in a zoo? That's what these things smell like. I mean, the smell is very real and it's very disgusting. Okay, one thing you need to understand before we get to the final part of this, and that's the idea of the celestial council. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there's, there's a whole panoply of celestial beings up there. That's why I prefer to call them celestial beings, because it's a broader designation than angels. First of all, there are angels, the Melachim, the messengers. Then secondarily, we have the chief angels, the archangels. Now, Hebrew lore says there's seven of them. But only two are mentioned in the Bible. Michael and, and Gabriel. And of course, uh, some people, Gabriel is never specifically called an archangel, but a lot of Bible scholars um, identify him with the angel that blows the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. It talks about the trump of the archangel. And that's why Gabriel is now associated with a trumpet. That may not even be right, but it's, it's a popular little tradition that's come down through the years. Additionally, we have Raphael, who's the angel of healing. 
He's out of the apocryphal book of Tobias. We have Uriel, uh, who is the earth angel. He's in charge of the earth. And then there's also three other angels whose names escape me. But those are the seven angels. Again, only two of them are actually in the Bible, so there's only two. But you see in, I think it's in one of the apocryphal books, Raphael it is, Raphael, and you see the word Rapha in there, which means healer. His name means God heals, El heals. And uh, anyway, he says, I am Raphael, one of seven who stand before the Lord. And that's where this idea, which is again not in the scripture, it's in the, uh, the, that's in the apocryphal books that are in the Catholic Bible, but not in our Bible. Um, anyway, that's where this idea of seven archangels comes from. Then we have the seraphim. These are the most awesome of all angelic beings. And, and though it doesn't really say this in the Bible, most people feel they are the highest order of angels. They are so brilliant and so powerful. The name itself means flaming ones, or oddly enough, flaming serpents. And all they do is, is fly before the throne of God day and night singing what is commonly called the Trisagion, the thrice holy. Kadosh, 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 Yahweh, Kavod, Melecho, Haretz. You know, holy, 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 Yahweh Elohim of hosts. And night and day, and they have six wings. And with two they fly, and with two they cover their faces, and with two they cover their feet. And this, this is right in the scripture. This is in Isaiah. And, you know, that's because of their, they're so holy, but they're also so awestruck because they are right up against the face, as it's called, pen al the face of Elohim that they actually cover their faces out of awe and out of respect. And they just sing this day and night, forever and ever. And they never leave his presence except once. And that's what's really strange. Because if you understand the Hebrew, you know that one scene when the, um, the Israelites were complaining in the wilderness and Yahweh sent, it says, fiery serpents among them. And whoever was bitten by those serpents died. And then he told Moshe to raise up this staff with the brazen serpent on it, which is a type of Christ. And anyone who looked upon that serpent would be healed. Well, the Hebrew word for that is the same word that's used for seraphim. So for whatever reason, the Almighty got really honked off at the Israelites at that point and sent his most powerful angels down there to trouble them. But normally they never leave the throne. Speaking of the throne, we have the cherubim or cherubim. These are the four living creatures. Uh, the word means one who prays or one who intercedes. And it, it is believed that these, there are originally five of them. We'll talk about that in a second. It is believed by most Bible scholars that originally there were five of them. And four of them were the actual throne upon which Yahweh sat. And the other one, the fifth one, covered him. Now, does that ring a bell with anybody? Lucifer is described in Ezekiel 28 as being the anointed cherub who covereth. Now, think of this. If you look at how the, the cherubim are described in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelations, what do we got? We've got one with the face of a man, one with the face of an ox, one with the face of an eagle, and one with the face of a lion. What does that mean? Well, 